guys, what's up? Sean Wick, Survey 91. Uh, here to do a battle mechanics video. I've been interacting for months with people on the C4 Discord, going over battle mechanics. Um, you know, and I, I've always talked about doing a video. I just haven't had the time. Sorry about the low tech. You know, I just don't have the time to set up a computer and get all savvy with that stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, just not, uh, just not uh, savvy enough, and I don't have the patience for it. So I hope you guys can tolerate it. But I hear I'm here to do the video that you know I really think the game needs. It's really frustrating to me that I had to figure a lot of this stuff out on my own. There's a lot of people out there um, doing videos. Uh, you know, we lost King Singh, which is a real tragedy. Uh, I consider him a fucking hero when it comes to this game. Uh, you know, and uh, Genghis eat a bag of dicks. You suck. Uh, you were one of the worst players I've ever seen. Um, and the, your videos are terrible. Uh, there's nothing important or worthwhile to the game. I'm all about the game. I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to play politics. I'm just going to tell you guys, people need to learn the basics of the mechanics of the game. So, um, you know, everybody knows Ebony. Everybody who's that is on this video is probably an addict like I am. Uh, but I'm addicted for a really unique reason. And I think it's because I think a lot of people consider this game like checkers. When it's actually like 3D chess, there's so many layers uh, that determine the outcome of a battle, and everybody's trying to figure it out. And I think it, it, people are looking in the wrong place. And right here, you see this rally spot right in the center of the screen. That's where the key to the game lies. And if you tap on that, you get this screen, the troop details, when you get to uh, the troop details menu. This tells you what you've got. This tells you where your troops are. This is, you know, the layers. But if you tap on each tier, you get each tier's troops characteristics and right here if you tap on it everybody knows attack hp defense and they all talk about buffs and generals and subsidies and all the stuff that changes those three numbers that's not where the game lies the game lies in the two other numbers there's two traits every troop has two types of traits the first trait is the intrinsic traits it's the troops intrinsic hp attack and defense it doesn't determine or alter necessarily the way it interacts with the environment or the battlefield. It's how each troop interacts with one another when it's being attacked or attacking. And it's how much damage you do. And when your HP hits zero, the troop dies and the defense mitigates the attack that gets done. And the HP is like, think of its fuel tank and the different types of troops have all that stuff. And I'll cover all the intrinsic traits in the second video, but more important than that is the extrinsic traits, the speed and the range right there. Speed, range, incredibly important numbers. And they determine not only the order of the troops on the battlefield, but what order your troops are going to encounter those troops. And that's what should every rally runner and every PvP player should be running through their head between scouting, battle reports, and on the battlefield. And if you want to excel there, you're not going to do it without knowing those numbers and how memorizing them and understanding how they interact. So if you look at each different troop, you have the ground troops here, speed, range, 50, speed, 350, mounts, 650. Archers, and again, I don't like when people call archers range. This is a game that involves like 180 countries, and the Google Translator changes the word range into range and doesn't use archers. So I like to use the word archers. Speed is 100, range is 500. Now let's look at the first two. The first two ranges were 50 and 50. The range of the archer is 500, 10 times as far. Pretty important, okay? And then you have Siege, which has got a range of 2,178 at a native unbuff number and a speed of 75. So let's talk about these two troops. You have the melee troops. The melee troops are the ones that use hand-to-hand -hand combat. They are the mount and the ground. And that's why their range is only 50. They're the shortest range. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is you have to be on top of each other to kill each other. They're the fastest troops with speeds of 350 and 600, but they've got lowest range. Now you have the, what I call the ranged troops, which use ranged weapons, which are the archers and the siege, with slow speeds. So a melee troop, and this is the actual definition off of Google for melee, is something that uses a skirmish or a scuffle, which is a perfect definition. Uh, uh, like to think of that the mount and the ground have to get physically up front and close to each other to kill each other. A ranged weapon, the ranged troops using, 
is a weapon that can engage targets beyond hand-to-hand -hand distance. Again, Wikipedia de de definition here. A distance greater than the physical reach of the user holding the weapon itself. The act of using such a weapon is also known as shooting. So the, the easiest way to, this is all of the numbers that you need to memorize. Anybody who wants to be the rally runner for your, for your server or your alliance has got to know these numbers. The ranges for ground and mount are the shortest at 50. And I like to think of feet. Uh, you know, they have these nebulous random numbers. It could be feet, could be miles, kilometers, whatever. I think it's just more realistic to use feet. The archers can shoot you from 500 feet away. And then the biggest change in the game in the last 10 years, outside of maybe having an assistant general, was the creation in 2020, in October, when they changed an update that changed all the siege ranges to increase with the higher tiers. This is very unique and makes siege entirely relevant as opposed to before that when it was completely useless. So siege, one, two, three, four, lumped in with the shortest range and so on. Five, six, seven, eight with another one, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 13, 14 with the longest range in the game is 2178. That's super important to understand. These are again, native unbuffed. And just for teaching purposes, I'm not gonna go into the buffs until the very end. Your traps have a range of 1500. Why is that incredibly important? Well, if you're going to build a lot of fire arrows to get sieges, to kill siege, and their range is 2178 and the traps lie at 1500, guess what? Those sieges are going to house you before the traps are even affected. So I don't even bother building fire arrows. I actually just build tons of rock for the inevitable range rallies that are going to come on battlefields. So again, knowing these numbers and knowing how important they are and how they interact, again, important to your build, important to your trapped builds. Uh, important to understand that that's going to determine how the troops interact with each other as intrinsic traits. Let's move on to speed. Mount, fastest troop, 600. Ground, 350 right behind them, right on the battlefield. Archers, 100 speed, siege 75. Traps don't move. Traps have a speed of zero. This is important because you need to understand, just like the movies and just like battlefields, you want the archers in siege to move slowly so they keep the distances far from what they're killing. You want the ground and mount troops to be fast because they have to be up close to kill you. This is important to understand because if we run a simulation with no enemy, and just looking at the distance per turn relationships, remember this is a turn-based game. Attacker goes, then defender goes, then attacker goes, and defender goes. And there's a lot of videos out there of people with conjecture about who goes first. You don't need to know. All you need to know is that at the end of every turn, a troop will have moved and will have attacked. And if there's a troop in range, it'll attack a troop in range. And if there's no troops in range, it whiffs. So let's look at, again, sorry about the low tech. This is just my kids, little army toys, little knights. And you have four types of troops in a battlefield. Turn zero, this is the start of the engagement. Now, you should know, and the rule that we do know, is that all battles start when the first troop is in range. So this will be roughly 2,700 on a fully buffed siege, T-13, 14 on the battlefield. And you have all of them starting at zero. This is the start, turn zero. After turn one, their speeds right? Let's go back to that speed page. These are the speeds, 600, 350, 100, 170, uh, and 75. After turn one, that's how far they've moved down the battlefield. So you've got your mount in the front, ground second, range third, siege in the back. Turn two, look what happens. After just two turns, your siege is now 150, that's two turns for it. Your range is now 200. Your archer, excuse me, are 200. Your ground is at 700. So he's out there just between the mountain ranged. And your mount is all the way out at 1,200. Now, what's significant about the 1,200 being out, 1,200 out and the range being at 200? Well, that's 1,000 feet apart. And the archer's range is only 500. This mount is running out with no archer coverage to protect him. The ground after two turns is just at the border of the end of where he's protected by the archer. 
And the siege is the only thing that can protect the mount. Why is that important? Well, if you're building a defense and you want to actually try to see if those mounts are protected, you're not going to protect them with ranged troops. Some people build a whole ton of range or build ground, thinking ground is going to kill range troops. They're going to come for your mount. They're not. The only troop long enough, far enough, with a range that can reach anything attacking that mount is siege. So when building defense, you want a heavy, heavy siege presence to protect your mount. I've gotten to the point where I don't even have to ghost my mount. I love when people throw archers at my mount because my siege wipes them out. This is the way to think about it. When you think of these movie epics, these army epics, they have tiers of troops, one after the other. Braveheart, uh, these are all my great, my favorite movies, right? Gladiator, Braveheart, Kingdom of Heaven, all these great movie war epics with these troops. They're always lined up, and it's always horses in the front and infantry in the, in the, in the next behind, the ranged the archers in the back, and the siege all the way in the far back. Right? Mounted out front. So the way to think about that, and you want to visualize that for a little bit when you're trying to get used to what's the battlefield order. The order of troops, based on those extrinsic traits, is always going to be on a battlefield. Mount out front, ground second, archer third, siege fourth. It's important to understand also that melee troops don't move past each other till they're all annihilated. In other words, a mounted troop's not going to take one swing at a layer of mounted in front of it and move on to kill the archers behind it or ground. It's, there's a scrum. Anybody who follows rugby will know that word. That creates from the melee troops in the battlefield that mounted and ground meet in the middle. And they stop advancing and they duke it out until one wins. That's huge to know for the outcomes of battles. Simulation two. Right. Let's just pretend, and this is, again, a way to actually understand how T-14, we're going to go one T-14 siege troop with the longest range versus one T-14 mounted troop, which is powerful, but also the fastest troop. At turn zero, the range, the native, and I've put the number, the values in the bottom left corner, right? Siege range is 2178. The speed is 75. The mount speed is 600 and the range is 50. So at turn zero, at least the start of the battle, they're 2178 apart. After one turn, the siege has moved 75 across the battlefield. The mount has moved 600. The distance has reduced between the two by 675, their speeds as they head together. I know, right? Everybody's having flashbacks to their algebra equations. If the train moves to the northeast, you know, at 400 miles an hour, what, you know, what X, does X equal? And all you people that hate math, well, this game might not be for you because this is what you do all day whenever you're doing battles battlefields looking at battle reports. So what is interesting here is the range. The mounted range is 50. Is there anything within 50 of in front of that mount? Zero. So that guy on that horse throws his spear or whatever, shoots his spear and forward and hits air, nothing. The siege gets a hit on the mount. So after one turn, the siege gets a hit, one hit up in the upper right corner, you'll see I tally the hits. The mount got zero, two hits. They are now 853 apart. The siege got one hit on the mount, right? That's two hits unrequited by the siege and the mount still gets zero. After three hits, the siege gets three, mount gets zero. They're 178 apart. Can you see that? And again, I'm, I'm a surgeon, so don't make fun of my handwriting. That's why I'm a surgeon. So 178 apart. That's not under 50. The mount still whiffs. Three hits, the siege gets unrequited. Now, when you get to turn four is when the mount is on top of the siege. So that's four hits for siege, one for mount. And you go to your intrinsic traits now to decide who would win. And you would look, when you look at the numbers, the siege is too weak to kill a mount with even four unrequited hits. It, it's something like seven or eight it needs. So the, the mount there beats siege and this is why when you've got to keep with only siege left you throw mount in right and these are unbuffed numbers the order of troops on a battlefield is always siege in the back archer in the back and next then ground up front right behind mound 
mounted. So the important thing to understand here is you've got melee up front, the ranged weapons in the back, and as turns move forward, the distances between them differ by the differences in their speed. So in other words, after one turn, Archer was 500 away from the mount. Right? Mount 600, Archer's 100. Two turns, it's 1,000 apart. Three turns, it's 1,500 apart. Four turns, it'd be 2,000 apart. That would never really happen since the longest battlefield is 27 and they would meet somewhere in the middle of the enemy. But it's important to understand that these distances increase as turns move on and that they determine the interaction of each troop with the other. And I'm going to talk to you about here what happens when you're choosing an army to rally with and you're looking at a keeps either last battle reports, you know what they have left, you can go through the reinforcements, you know what's on the battlefield, and this actually determines what you're going to send. So let's just percent, pretend you're going up against a keep that you just wiped out all its mount, or its mount was dead, or its underdeveloped mount, or whatever reason its mount is off the battlefield. You cross it off a little X here. All you've got is ground there now first. Now, let's pretend you just, let's play it through your head and do the mind experiment. You hit it with, a, with an archer army. What's going to happen? Well, those ground are going to close the distance on your archers, and they are tanks. Their intrinsic traits are very powerful. That's in the another video where we'll go through a battle report. So you send archers into, a, into a, a battlefield with ground, archer, and siege on it. Your ground is going to kill you. So what do you send at this army whenever you've got a keep that's only got siege, archer, and ground? Well, you send mounted. You send mounted at them. When someone's mounted is gone and the first line of troops is dead, they've left the door open for you. Just The ground troops are naked. Send your ground in them. You're mounted in them, excuse me. Send your mounted right in. Let's pretend ground is gone. Mounted's still there. Right? You've got siege in the back, archer, then mounted front. Well, you're going to look at the report. You're going to look at how much siege they have. If they have a ton of siege, and you want to send ranged, not going to do great. Because their siege troops are going to kill your archers before they can, but from 20, 2,700 away, before your archers can get within 500 of those mounts. If they have under 12 million of siege, under 15 million of siege, and you can send a 20 or 30 million archer mount rally, you will house their mount. If they have 30 million T14, T15 siege, yeah, you're not going to do so well with archers here. You're going to have to send siege first to kill their siege. Then you can send range to house their mount. What if their archers are gone? Well, there is there's the mount out front again. Does it really change the battle mechanic for you? Not so much. The mount's still out front. The siege is back protecting it. Same as the last guy. That's the interesting thing. When archers are gone... You still either want to send siege to wipe out the siege if it's too much to hand, for your archers to handle, or you send your archers at their mount in the front. What if their siege is gone? Well, this is the fun one. You can send... The, the siege was protecting the mount. You send an archer tra attack. At, some people might say send siege. The siege will target the archers. Well, the mount's going to be on your siege really fast. You'll still probably be positive and it won't be a death blow, but if you send archers at this with no siege to kill your arch siege of your enemies to kill your archers, it's going to be a bloodbath, absolute bloodbath. So, the, when the mounts are out front, usually they give you an opportunity to kill them with ranged, if the siege are absent. Now, these extrinsic traits are buffable. Let's talk about range bonus, I mean, skill books. You have the range, range troop range bonus. Now, bonus means it doesn't increase. It's added on to the, add to the last number. Now, that's the way I take it. So when range troops have a range of 500, this turns it into 600. The siege bonus adds 200 after your hero gear, 15, 10%, or, you know, arch gear or whatever, goes in. So in other words, I believe, since they use the word bonus here in this game is so literal, that the 200 gets tacked on to the end after the percentage buffs are calculated. Mounted troop speed increases by 20%. So you'll see the mounted troop speed go from 600 to 720. Mounted ground troop speed goes from 350 to 420. All you stoners out there, I know are giggling to yourselves. And this is important because 
right? Melee troops become deadlier and take less hits on their way to kill when they're faster, right? Ranged troops are more deadly when they can kill from further away. Hence, they only give range bonuses to the ranged troops, and they only give speed bonuses to the melee troops. This was a game changer. I was new to the game and just really started building power when this came out, the Choreo Bracers. And this was the first time that the, the Siege Machine attack range had a 15% buff. The Arch Gear and the Ares Gear gave you a 10% buff. And I remember I was one of, you know, I, I went right for it. I saw that 15%. I said, that's going to be kind of a game changer. And I did a battlefield right after I had it. And an older server who I don't even know even knew that the ranges changed by tier sent a T9 and a T11 and a T14 siege rally on me. And they all got crushed because they didn't have, there, there was no, everybody had their choreo bracers on their wall general, not on their attacking general. And this is where it was a game changer. First when the choreo came out, then when Abyss bracers and high on bracers came out with 15%. Then you could have. Then it was more uh, equitable for the siege attacks. You know, it, it had favored defenders heavily up until that because nobody in their right mind is going to put the siege choreo bracers on an attacking general. They all wanted them on the defending. So again, important siege machine attack range fifteen percent. That is the massive buff. So if you buff fifteen percent on the native twenty one seventy eight for the tw- the T thirteen fourteen, you're looking at twenty five hundred and change. Then you put that skill book on that for 200 more, and you're a little bit over 2,700 range for the maximum range in the game right now. Right? Courageous Ares, Courageous Arch, they both are 5% un- unstarred when you get to 5, 10 stars. I'm sorry, 5 stars. They go up to 10% Siege Machine attack range. Those were the furthest. So, again, you can play with these numbers and play with these buffs, but generally... Having these buffs are a must do. Uh, there's really, there's really, the, the, there's the alter uh, outcomes from the mechanic changes from buff versus unbuffed is really, it's almost, you know, eons and orders of magnitude away from each other. So um, if you don't have them, honestly, if, and people ask all the time, what's hero gear should I get? Uh, it's my first time getting hero gear, and I say, I love Choreo Bracers and Abyss Bracers and or High on Bracers. Three must-haves for this game. The skill books will get you the rest of the way, but you really need them. Uh, that's it for this video for this guy, for you guys for extrinsic traits. If you have any questions, uh, you know, hit me up either on Discord or in the game. Uh, if you if you have uh, uh, time, hit up the second video on intrinsics, and we'll go through some battle reports.